Hi, I'm Jim, W6LG. Well, that's a surprise. <laughs> I'm surprised. So, uh, I'm surprised by the amount. It's crap in it. I want to be understood. I'm a communicator, not a broadcaster. Greetings. I'm Jim, W6LG, as you can tell by the call sign growing out of the back of my head. Hi, I'm Jim, W6LG. Welcome to my radio room here on Wolf Mountain. It's another hot day, and fortunately there are no fires close, but uh, there certainly is a big one burning on the coast. So I've got the scanner going as much as I can, uh, trying to listen to the fire traffic. Do you need a linear amplifier? And what is a linear amplifier? And what do you do with it when you get it? Well. The answer to those questions really depends. If you're going to think about getting a linear amplifier or an amplifier, um, make sure that your antenna is the best it can be before you make the purchase of the amplifier. It doesn't make any sense to run 1500 watts into a really lousy antenna when the antenna can make a huge difference. Um, so, And the feed line. The feed line is crucial. Um, you put up a good antenna and you, use, you lose a lot of power in your feed line, it's no good. So feed line is crucial. A nice antenna, if you're out in the country, maybe you can put up a hex beam or a tri-band beam, uh, fairly simple antennas. Um, if you're in an area with antenna restrictions, maybe you can sneak a vertical in the backyard when nobody's looking or they won't even know what it is. Again, feed line is important. Um, what is a linear amplifier and why is it called a linear amplifier? Because it's long? Well, it has to do with linearity and you want the amplifier to amplify the signal but not change its characteristics so it doesn't distort it or change the waveform. So you want it to be uh, linear. And most amplifiers do a pretty darn good job of, of amplifying without adding a bunch of distortion. That's not the CB amplifiers that you see on uh, on eBay, but I'm talking about ones made by like a Maritron or a Collins or a Drake or a Heathkit. All those produce really pretty clean signals. How big of an amplifier do you need? Well, if you're running 10 watts, you may want to run 100 watts, and that's a 10 times increase, which is darn near 2S units, so that's a sizable increase. If you're running 100 watts and you go to 400 watts, that's 100 to 200 is doubling, there's 3 dB. 200 to 400 is another 3 dB. That's 6 dB, which is roughly equivalent to 1S unit. So that's a big difference. So going from 100 watts to 400 watts with a fairly simple amplifier makes a big difference. The next increment beyond that, if you're talking about starting at 100 watts, would be to go from 600 to 1200 to get another 3 dB. And then you're bumping up against the, the legal limit of 1500 watts, and there's no difference between 1200 watts and 1500 watts. So you can come close to almost 2S units um, when you go to full power, a uh, full legal limit, and that's a huge a huge increase. We're lucky that the FCC has allowed us to run 1500 watts because think about it just for a second if you have an antenna with let's say 6 dB gain you've got a tri-bander or a, a monoband antenna and it's a it's a beam and it has 6 dB gain that's four times so you've got uh, an ERP of maybe uh, if you've got let's say 13, 14 100 watts of the antenna times four, you know, the ballpark of five to 6,000 watts of ERP, which is huge. And that's enough to talk around the world. Uh, that's enough to, to loop the planet. So we're lucky to have that. And um, I've got a Drake L4B over here on a table. I'm going to shoot some video of it. The basic components of an amplifier and what kind of amplifiers are there? Um, Probably if I would break them into two categories, the solid state ones, which are coming on strong and offer a lot of bang uh, for the buck, and the older designed, um, still functional, great amplifiers with tubes. 
Transistorized amps are about 50% efficient. Um, you can get an amp that will run a um, 1,000 watts. It's instant on, instant band changing, no tuning. You're probably going to need an antenna tuner to follow it. Uh, I've got a um, uh, an Allocraft KPA 500, a 500 watt amplifier. It works slick. Turn it on, bam, you're there. Um, no tuning, no fuss, no muss. It doesn't like SWR, uh, so it, you really have to have some kind of tuner following it. And, it, and some, some transistorized amps have a tuner built in. So you go to a band and bam, it's there. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean you can load up uh, RG8X to a 600 ohm impedance antenna and it's going to work. The laws of physics still apply. You want the feed line to match at the feed point. You want a decent antenna system. But the transistorized amps, uh, they're becoming better and better every day. And the ones I see from uh, some of the foreign companies are just amazing. Uh, um, Ameritron has a couple of really neat um, amplifiers that will give you years and years and years of service with probably not much to go wrong. Tube amps are neat in a couple of ways. Um, one, they're they're pretty forgiving, so they can load into a high SWR because you have a tank circuit and you're you're going to tune the amplifier. You're going to change the band switch and adjust the loading control and the tuning control for a maximum output. I did a video on how to tune up a linear if you want to go look at that. Um, they offer um, fairly high power. Um, you can buy a, like a Drake L4B in fairly good condition for about a thousand bucks. It'll run 1,200 watts. Uh, it's a great amp. SP220, same price range for a good one. Uh, they're relatively plentiful. <clears throat> a lot of uh, as guys are passing away and becoming silent keys, the amplifier is sometimes a hard thing to sell. So you can pick one up at an estate sale sometimes for not a lot of money. Uh, typical tube is, um, let's see if I've got one here. Well, I've got, I've got this tube. This is a, um, a Russian tube. And the interesting thing about it is it's in two pieces. This is really heavy. This probably weighs six to eight pounds on its own. And this is the cooler, so you blow air through the bottom of this and out the top. Now, before you think that this is some huge tube, it's really not. It's a, the equivalent of about three 500 Zs. Uh, it'll run 1500 watts RTTY uh, for 30 minutes with uh, with no issues. This is a, a, a three 500 Z. It developed a plate to grid short, so it can't be used. This has got 500 watts of plate dissipation. It's roughly the thir a third the size of the Russian tube. Uh, a lot of amps have two of these. That's a thousand watts of plate dissipation. What's plate dissipation? Well. My rule of thumb is figure that uh, if, uh, if the amp is a typical ground or grid amp, it's going to be anywhere from 60 to 65 percent efficient if, we're, if you're lucky. Grid dissipation is, is in, my, uh, in my book, the difference between the input power and the output power. So if the amplifier is running 2,500 watts input and 1,500 watts output, the difference between 2,500 and 1,500 is 1,000 watts of plate dissipation, and it would take two of these tubes to do that. Can you abuse these tubes? Sure. Um, you can run more power than they're capable of handling and blow them up fairly quickly. Uh, if you don't tune this tube properly and couple the output to the tank circuit, in other words, you improperly tune the amp, uh, and the tube dissipates the, the, the drive, in the grid, uh, you can fry the grid and the tube goes flat. Uh, a tube like this might last 50 years. Uh, hard to say, but um, there's some out there that are 40 years old that I've got that still put out full power. If you abuse the tube or if you don't properly tune it, you can kill a tube in six months. So it's incumbent on the owner to uh, make sure that he gets the plate red hot to get her the uh, oxygen in the tube. The other thing about a tubed amplifier is it can kill you. So it's real important to 
respect high voltage. Uh, the amplifier that that's in um, has about 3,000 volts on the plates, and that's about what this has. All right, I'm going to stop the video here. I'm going to go over uh, and show you the uh, the guts of a Drake L4B and kind of the major components, and then we'll, we'll all come back and finish up. Okay, this is a Drake L4B, a uh, pretty nifty amplifier. There's the band switch, the um, plate tuning capacitor, loading capacitor, meter switch. That's an ALC adjustment and puts the amplifier in and out of service. Plate current meter, and that meter is kind of a multimeter. It does uh, watts, uh, grid current, and plate voltage. The amplifier is really pretty simple. Um, it looks complicated, but it, it's not really. Um, there are two tubes in this amplifier. Uh, high voltage comes in the back at this uh, uh, red connector, down that wire to the bottom of the plate choke. High voltage comes up the plate choke. It's a choke because we don't want RF going that way, and I'll show you why in just a second. The high voltage goes to the two tubes. These are called parasitic chokes. They um, Stop parasitics above 10 meters. We, they're kind of tricky, but um, they're really necessary in an amplifier that has some gain. These two yellow capacitors are called doorknob capacitors. They're also called plate blocking capacitors. They keep high voltage from going to the tank circuit. High voltage stays this way. Um, so high voltage comes up the tubes to the two tubes. RF comes out of the tubes, flows through this capacitor. So the, this part of the, uh, the circuit is carrying DC and RF common mode uh, into the tank circuit. Tank circuit, that's the plate tuning capacitor, and down below is the plate loading capacitor, tank coil, and the, uh, the band switch, which is ceramic, and uh, it drives a chain drive. There works another switch on the bottom, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, that's the filament transformer for the two tubes. The tubes draw a fair amount of current, so it takes a large transformer. Blower in the back sucks in air through a hole, blows it into the chassis, and it comes up through these chimneys between the glass of the tubes and the chimney. And I'm going to flip this over as best I can with one arm, and it is heavy. Okay, that's the bottom of a Drake L4B. There's the um, plate tuning, plate loading capacitor. Uh, that's a step start, so when I turn it on, it takes a few seconds before it uh, um, it puts a resistor in the circuit for a couple of seconds to stop the inrush current. There's the bottom of the filament transformer. So the filament transformer generates filament voltage that goes towards the two tubes uh, through this filament choke. Choke is there to keep RF from going back towards the transformer. RF is here because the tuned input circuit is right here. So from the changeover relay, when this thing is engaged, RF flows down this RG58 through one of these coils, they're 80 through 10 meters, and then connects to the cathode of the tubes. So again, we have a, a circuit where we've got AC voltage and we've got RF so we're trying to keep the two separate. Um, that's really it. This is a, a watt meter sensor and that's the changeover relay. Uh, the two um, the in and out uh, coax connectors are on the back and they're right there. Anyway that's a Drake L4B. Not all that complicated. Great little amp. Um, can run 1200 watts all day long. Okay, so that's a Drake L4B. Um, so the major parts of a linear amplifier tube one would be uh, the tuned input, that's the part where the RF goes in, uh, the tubes, which do the amplifying. They can be either triodes or tetrodes, three or four uh, components on the inside. Uh, the tank circuit to get the uh, RF from the tube out to the antenna. Uh, the power supply. Uh, power supply consists of a transformer, some rectifiers, silicon diodes, and some capacitors. 
can be uh, a full wave or perhaps a voltage doubler. Um, also in the amplifier are some chokes. A lot of devices, a lot of parts of the amplifier have RF and DC voltage on them or RF and AC voltage and we want to get the RF going one direction and the DC to go a different uh, as you saw in the, uh, the Drake L4B. So having looked at a Drake L4B it's a bit intimidating. Uh, I think for a beginner it might not be a good choice uh, because it is a little bit complicated. Stuff is going to go wrong. Uh, I've had seven of those. Um, there are repair issues that come up. I've got a lot of parts from cadavers of L4Bs. Um, but they're a great amp and they'll, they're relatively inexpensive. Um, one that's in bad condition you can pick up for six, seven hundred dollars and uh, get damn near legal limit. So that's a linear amplifier and I didn't really answer the question do you need one and the answer is probably not but if you've got a good antenna up and you're interested in working DX and you've got good feed line going to the antenna system you've done all that stuff the best you can do uh, an amplifier can give you darn near 2S units increase in signal strength if you have a lousy antenna that 2S units isn't going to do you much good because you're not going to be able to hear the people who are answering you um, and you're not going to be able to hear the DX so it makes no point to have uh, to have a linear. Get the antenna set, the feed line set, all that done the best you can do then think about a linear amplifier and um, today my choice if I were buying an amp uh, probably would be a solid state one because there's just there's not likely going to be a lot of maintenance. They run on 50 volts, a um, lot of current. Um, some that run relatively lower power, uh, you can plug into a 120 volt outlet. Um, others require 240 volts. But the instant on, boom, you, you hear a DX station, you press a button, that thing's on. That's what I do with a KPA 500. Running out of time. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, uh, please subscribe. Uh, most of my videos are going to be on ham radio basics and uh, going to cover topics uh, in kind of a simple way. Not going to do a lot of math. Uh, just my 53 years of experience and what I know about something. Anyway, thanks for joining me. 73. This is Jim, W6LG on Wolf Mountain. See you next time.